be an executive producer, and he's also... I also have it on good authority that he writes all of Bear's best lines. That's Greg Plagueman. <laughs> Next we have as Lionel Fusco. He plays the often bewildered but always lovable homicide detective who has a million nicknames for his cohorts. Give it up for Kevin Chapman. As Samantha Groves, a.k.a. Root, she plays the deadly psychopath who's allowed Shaw to warm her cold, cold heart. This is Amy Acker. As Harold Finch, he's the brains, and this season, the conflicted heart behind Team Machine's operation. Please welcome Michael Emerson. he's made it down here as John Reese he's the man in the suit and a lifelong foe of kneecaps around the world <laughs> Jim Caviezel <laughs> and last but not least he's the creator and executive producer person of interest and the only person in this room who I think will knows when Shaw will actually be back on the show Jonathan <laughs> Nolan <laughs> Please, have a seat, guys. So, John, Jonah and Greg, I'll start with you. Obviously, I don't want to spoil too much for our fans that are watching at home, but we just saw the episode here in the room. Tell me about why now was the time for you guys to sort of revisit uh, Detective Carter, bringing her back into the mix in this you know, very deep uh, episode for the show. Well, you know, we, we had always said um, from, uh, from Taraji's departure from the show, uh, that you know, everyone lives forever in flashback on person of interest. We're very, very <laughs> sorry to see her go, and, and from the beginning had been cooking up a way to get Cookie back, uh, back on our show. <laughs> um, so I reached out to her late last year. We knew you know, Empire hadn't come out yet, but we knew that because they were doing a short order, sort of a, a spring, um, or, or rather a mid-season debut, that, uh, <clears throat> that she might have some time, and usually towards... A more internal episode before the last couple episodes, which are usually the ones in which all hell breaks loose. Um, so it was kind of a perfect opportunity to get her back. Sure. And for for the cast, what was it like having her back on set, even for just you know a quick hit? Was it fun to sort of work with her again? Maybe Jim, especially he worked a lot with her. Good to have Taraji back on the show. I'm sorry, you? were you talking to me? Yes. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sure. I was just watching this brilliant man's work up there and, and how they wrote it all. I, I'm, I'm flabbergasted. I just watched it and I was really amazed that we got all that in. And, and There's a really strong performance from Jim Caviezel. <laughs> <laughs> They're amazing at, at keeping secrets. I had no idea Taraji was coming and I mean like literally 20 hours or 30 hours before and uh, they would change names and whatnot, and, and all of a sudden, there she was. So you're not going to ever find anything out on this show. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me, I've tried. You, he's telling the truth. So, well, speaking of, you mentioned it's a big performance for Jim. Obviously, uh, you know, a lot of the episode really is digging deep on sort of him, him wrestling with his personal life or maybe the lack thereof. Uh, what was that like for you to get that chance to sort of really go deep on Reese and sort of explore sort of these things that maybe has led to his isolation through the years? Uh, it's a great opportunity, but uh, on this show, there's not a lot of time. And uh, you read it and you go, wow, that's going to be difficult. So, um, but obviously you're up to the challenge and you want to be able to hit it. And with Reese, it's all, it's here and it's just contained down to that. Um, uh, I had no idea when I just saw it there. I said, God, we did that, you know. And, <laughs> but, it, but it happens sometimes. You get in the game, you're, you're playing, you don't remember anything. Uh, and then you watch it and you say, well, we did all that. I was, um, she's like a, uh, 
you know, I was saying to someone earlier about uh, Reese and the heart and head connection, it's kind of unplugged. And uh, he finally falls in love with her, but too late. Yeah. And tragic, but this just, I thought maybe could give somebody just a little bit of water. You know, it's, a, it's, it's, it's salt water everywhere. It's like a big <laughs> ocean. Uh, Chappie and I were just down in Naples. That's the tan going there. <laughs> oh, <little> golf. <laughs> but it's, it's at paradise everywhere, but really you can't drink it. And, and just a little bit of uh, uh, rainwater comes on the raft, and he's able to just keep it going a little bit longer. Right. Do you think either for Jonah or Jim or the, the, you know, Greg, the producers, do you think this episode would have been possible if it wasn't for what we've already explored with Reese this season with, through Iris and sort of tapping into some of that personal life there? Did that sort of tee this episode up? Do you think that he's sort of been ruminating on these things? It season? helps, de definitely, that heart and head connection coming together. But, you know, what these guys do great is they keep that mystery going. And uh, there's, there's a little bit there, but there's just that imperfection in all of us that, you know, um, and that's what the team is a lot of them pick that slack up and it's a functional but also a dysfunctional uh, family and uh, um, and I think that you know my mom says you know you see a lot we see a lot of ourselves in these characters and these are the guys that do a brilliant job bringing that out right well let's, I want to talk about the big picture of this season obviously I don't want to ruin too much for people who will see the episode tomorrow night but you definitely should check that out if you weren't in the room tonight but obviously this year has been so much about the machine and Samaritan. And you guys have always been, as David said earlier, one of the most prescient shows on television. Sort of you were ahead of you know, Snowden and all of these things. Uh, what was it about sort of this Cold War between these two AIs that really interested you guys? And to really go deep on that on, you know, on, a, on a broadcast TV show, it's, it's a rarity to get to do that. So what was sort of the inspiration of the thought about sort of really digging in on that topic this year? Well, you know, there's that point we, we had carefully... <laughs> We had, uh, I'll let someone else talk. <laughs> I'm excited. I've been writing all week. I'm like, I get to talk to people. It's very <laughs> Let's change of pace. Uh, there's that moment when you're pitching a TV show where they ask you what it's really about, and you're supposed to keep your mouth shut and tell them, it's about a crime of the week. And we, we sort of said, no, oh, it's about the kind of next moment that's coming in which, you know, our technology starts working for us, and we start working for our technology. And it's been kind of a, you know, a really interesting run on the show, seeing so many of these things sort of start to come to be. But we think that that question of artificial intelligence, which has long been kind of a big question of science fiction forever, 20 years in the future, I don't think it's 20 years in the future anymore. I think we're running headlong into it, and it's going to be very different from all the different versions of it that we've explored. I mean, for instance, the idea that there'd be more, more than one of these things uh, it seems, seems kind of so, so obvious, and that would be, they'd be in competition with each other. So, we're, we're super excited about it. Uh, absolutely. I think, you know, when you, when you talk about initially the show is about the surveillance state and people didn't really believe it and then the Snowden thing, NSA all happened. <clears throat> people sort of woke up and maybe there was a collective yawn <laughs> because we all, we all love our smartphones. But uh, I think when you say, oh, it's about artificial intelligence now, you say, well, what is that? I don't, I don't understand the, the complexity of that or whether you're talking to my parents or not or what, what is that? And you say, well, that's Siri. You know, that's, that's the flash crash in the market when an algorithm trades that many trades in volume at one time. All of a sudden, what have we seeded? What have we handed over? And I think that's sort of the fun and the insidiousness of artificial intelligence to a degree is that we're, we're, it's an invisible hand. And we're all, you know, guilty or privy to it or party to it, if only in the sense that um, out of convenience. It's great. We love it. An algorithm can decide for us. And they say, well, the fun of this show is to say, well, wait a second. What could happen? What could happen in the fields of medical technology, health insurance, social services, anything where an algorithm starts to enter into the equation? And I think that is the thing about our show to say, wait, this show is about something. Right. And I think you ground that excellently with all these great characters that are on the show. And so, Michael, obviously, I think part of that debate has been happening with Finch this season internally. He's having that debate about what he's created and, and the lives that have been lost. So tell us about that. How's it been to sort of play that sort of the, the, the oppression or the weight he carries on him given the thing that he created to do good has now sort of cost so many lives? Yeah. In a way, he's fortunate that he hasn't enough time now to reflect on what he's done. It, everything's up and rolling. And I, I think he has 
It's too late now for even his misgivings. You know, it's, it's done. That stuff's up. Samaritan's up and running. The machine is doing God knows what, a thing he made, and it's out of his hands now. It is independent and sentient and powerful. And who's running what now? So everybody's living underground. We are no longer masters of anything. It, it doesn't seem like. So it's, it's an interesting, maybe a, a unique dramatic dilemma for smart characters to be in the hands of and at the service of something that people made. It, it's, an, it, it's such an interesting theme, and I, I think compelling and worrisome to me. <laughs> That's right. Obviously, uh, your character has engaged in that debate to somewhat, to some degree, with with Root. I think you guys have shown opposite sides of that. So, do you think that either of them have rubbed off on the other? I, either of you can take the question. Do you think that you'll ever come around to seeing Root's way, and Root <laughs> the same? Will she ever come around to seeing Finch's way? Jeez. I mean, I think we've learned a lot. I have definitely learned a lot from from him and have changed way more than I think anyone thought that I would based on the things he's told me. Um, I, I think Mr. Finch feels as tenderly toward Root as you can toward a person who kidnapped and tortured you. <laughs> <laughs> and it, there's a kind of a charm about it. We don't dwell on it much. <laughs> I thought we were over that. <laughs> but we do, they, the two characters seem to be a team now. I mean, we, we, we've worked together a lot yeah. these last few episodes. There was a lot going on that it was up to us to either solve it or not. And <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> right, well, fo following on that, obviously we saw, you know, Root, as you said, who used to sort of maybe not be such a team player, really, you know, go out of her way to make sure that Finch, you know, didn't lose his life. What, what's it been like for you to track that journey from someone who, you know, really was out for her own ends to now sort of be a part of this team and care about both Shaw and now Finch sort of making those sacrifices? What's it been like for you to, to bring that to life? I mean, for me, that's been probably my favorite part of playing the role is the, they, the way that they've done that with the writing that I, I definitely wouldn't have known that that was going to happen. and. You know, I, I think for a while was always expecting to be killed any second because <laughs> I was, I was so <laughs> causing too much trouble. But um, yeah, I, I feel like maybe it's just me as an actor speaking, but I, I feel like I'm really part of the family now. So. <laughs> well, I, but family is a, is a good word. I, I feel like in some shadowy sub-basement of this narrative, this is a dysfunctional family <laughs> story. <laughs> And it may be funnier than we all think. I often think it's funny. But n nonetheless, it's active and yeah. has some warmth. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin has been sort of on the outside of that family. Uh, you know, Fusco has been on the outside of that family through some of this. Gets in and out, pops in and out. What's it been like this year, sort of kicking around with Reese in the precinct? Do you think he's taught him anything? Has he learned anything? How, what's it been like for, for Fusco this year? What has two thumbs and got to kiss Amy Eckes this season? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's great. It's great having Reese as a partner, and um, there are days I'd like to <laughs> there are days I'd like to throw him off the roof, and there are days I want to help him uh, back on. No, um, it's uh, it's been great. It's uh, you know, it, it's funny. I think as we continue on down this path that. Eventually, Fusco will uh, gain more knowledge of the machine. Uh, if you just the, see that last episode where um, Mr. Finch is in the hospital and Fusco is kind of standing behind him with a very puzzled look, more than normal, <laughs> <laughs> as he references the machine. And, um, I, you know, I think that Fusco knows that there's something there, but he's not really quite sure what it is and, and, and how to gain that knowledge. Right. We, I mean, we've already referenced tonight Root and Finch's relationship has gone from point A to point B. You think about where Fusco and Reese started at the beginning of this show, totally out on opposite ends and now working together. You know, Jonah and Greg, how do you guys, when you think about the show, how important is it to sort of totally just blow these relationships up and change the dynamics all the time? I mean, it happens, it seems like, every season we go to different territory. How difficult is that, but how rewarding is it also for you guys? Uh, we love it. Uh, as much as we can move these characters in and out of the gray, fantastic. And 
Th th there's a wonderful line that Kevin has uh, with Jim when he talks about being a detective, and he, and he says, y you know, you're a horrible detective. But, it, <laughs> but you feel like it doesn't have any bearing whatsoever on their friendship. And it really, it, it, it's the two of them, as a matter of circumstance, thrust into this situation. And, and Kevin plays it so wonderfully because it's almost like he forgives him in the moment, you know? <laughs> and, and, and I feel like that's the fun of our show is that we can thrust people into roles that necessarily aren't true, that aren't conventional. And, and, and Reese is a stone cold killer in this odd position of being a homicide detective. And yet, Chappie's character, he totally accepts it. It just is what it is. And, and, and I feel like, you know, whether, whether Fusco is read in or not, there's a question sometimes as to whether or not he wants to be. And I think maybe that's up to him. Right. We, we have great fun um, building bad guys who have a point of view. And, you know, Amy's character definitely from the, from the, from the first season on is, is, you know, really has a kind of an ethos. And then it, it seems natural that at a certain point you cross over a line. These are all very dark characters. And my uncle keeps asking when he gets to be part of the family. <laughs> I keep saying, I don't think it's in the cards, sadly. <laughs> Did you have something you want to add, Jim? I, I, I just uh, say that between Fusco and I, really this season, it's been the Seahawks and the Patriots. <laughs> <laughs> and that didn't work out too well, did it? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I wanted to kill you. <laughs> Next year, I'll kill you. <laughs> you get the ring. Yeah. You move away for the Yankees? <laughs> uh, obviously, a, a big part of this season uh, revolved around uh, Shaw and sort of the mystery around Shaw. And obviously, you guys had to deal with some ex you know, extra circumstances with Sarah's pregnancy. And I think handled that as well as could be keeping the mystery alive. But you know what? What can you say for anybody? You know who? You know we saw her there alive, and so is that a character that you know we definitely will see more of down the line, or is that too much of a, a probing question to be answered? She had twins, boy and a girl. All right. Yeah. That's, that's the joke. Who has two thumbs and got to kiss that? <laughs> 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 uh, uh, we we talked with Sarah a little bit. She's got her hands full, quite literally, right now with uh, with with some beautiful babies. And just as soon as she's ready to come back and play, we're uh, we're I got enthusiastic about it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Excited to get her back. I was speaking with Kevin backstage. Obviously, you guys had a rough winter this year. Do you guys ever just get tired of of being out in the snow and the cold, or does that just help add to the stakes of the show for you guys? <laughs> <laughs> I think when I was reading this episode and things were happening that Reese needed to be saved, and I kept being like, please don't let it be me. He has to go. <laughs> <laughs> it looks really cold up there. <laughs> I mean, look, the, uh, whether it be, uh, you know, it did the Thin Red Line, we were in the jungle and it was over 100 degrees and humidity and stuff, and it just looks amazing on screen. So one thing that Jonah's always promised is that it's going to look like cinema. And you've got to suffer for your work, you know. And I think that, you know, whether it be our setups, we do a lot more setups than anybody else on television. That's why the quality is so damn good. And every episode is so damn good. There is no throwaway. We give it out every time. Um, whether it be Michelangelo, Jonah Nolan, you know, it's all good. Very sweet. Dave Inslee, who is our DP, does a remarkable job shooting yeah. the show. Yes, no, it's the whole thing. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's an incredible, incredible family that makes this show. And just a few of us up here today, but our, our crew, our New York-based crew, incredible. Uh, the, you know, and, and the writers back in Los Angeles who say, I would do a whole episode and a car would have broke a window in the snow. <laughs> you guys suffer for that. We, we sit around in L.A., Saying this is this, this will work out great. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think it's season five. We should make you write the episodes in a cooler. <laughs> <laughs> like when I, Jim's crawling through real snow there in that episode, and uh, you know, it, it, like Jonah said, a, a, a real credit to our to our uh, our crew here in New York, what they go through in those when it's the teens and Gail Berenger, our line producer, I think is here tonight somewhere. I don't know. Gail, hey, the back. Yeah.
Uh, Chris, Chris Fisher, uh, our producing director, phenomenal. He, he happens to be in New Orleans, I think, right now. But the most impressive thing, I, I think Jim and I were there the last night shooting, and it was down to 20 degrees or whatever it was, and we look out and we see our fans who were staying there with us throughout the whole night while we wrapped the episode. It was really phenomenal. And, yeah. uh, it was just like it, it really makes you feel something you're like wow the commitment to stay here all through the middle of the night to, to watch us wrap the episode was really something right uh, amy maybe alluded to this already because she said she thought she could be killed at any moment but you guys have obviously been committed to the idea that characters do have a beginning middle and end on the show and that they can go at any point if the story services that so i guess for the actors you know even with recent this episode that we just saw do you do you worry that your 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 number is up on the show at any point or do you think you know do you have the goods on these guys to stay alive a little bit longer well you guys can <laughs> <laughs> it's been like four years on president of interest <laughs> i open every script like this <laughs> <laughs> We're going to give you all their phone. <laughs> <laughs> now, the next one. Go to the next one. <laughs> you know, maybe for Jonah or Greg, how important is it to have those stakes? Obviously, you know, you feel like you, you have a show where the hero is always going to make it out okay. Maybe you lose interest, but for you guys, how, how significant is it to have that, the possibility that any of these characters could, you know, go vanish? I think, you know, we, we talked to a few members of the press, such as yourself, who'd seen this episode a couple days ago. I think the most gratifying thing that anyone said to us was that because of the way we built the show and, and, and you know, our track record, uh, gruesome track record to this point, they got to the point halfway through the episode where they really thought, man, are they killing off, are they killing off Jim's character? So I think it's the, the highest praise that the audience is watching it, not really knowing what might happen next, which is definitely something we wanted to achieve. Well, not to stay with the gruesome, but obviously, like you said, we like to sort of do, you like to go crazy toward the end of the season. I know that we only have a couple episodes left this season, so, uh, you know, you have Samaritan out there, you have the machine, you've got this gang war that's going on. What, what can we expect in, in a broad sense from these last couple episodes as we ratchet up those stakes once again? Well, we promised a war at the <laughs> beginning of the year, and uh, it's a bit of a bloodletting, so... Um, this is the time of year where we definitely like to get it all together and bang our toys together these last two episodes and uh, there's going to be some, some shocks and some surprises. And is anything from the cast that you guys having, having to list through? <laughs> anything you want to add to that? I overheard a conversation that was a group of people who have been on the show and they were all standing in a circle saying, did you get the call? Like, are you dead? Are you dead? <laughs> 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 So blood yeah. will be spilled, safe to say. We, we, Greg and I have to make these extremely awkward phone calls um, <laughs> when the script's about to be released where we have to call up the actors and let them know, you know, everyone was forever in flashback. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I think, Small consolation. I think, yeah. yeah, we had uh, probably had to make about half a dozen of those calls this, uh, for the set of finale. So. <clears throat> And then one artificial intelligence we had to let know. <laughs> that was very, that was very <laughs> Right, right. Well, the producers were adamant about wanting to take questions from you guys tonight, so I think there's going to be some microphones that are making their way around. So if you have a question, go ahead and raise your hand. Please wait for the microphone because we are on a live show. Phones and ask these guys some questions. We'll start right here in the front row. All right, hey everyone. Uh, I really don't want to jump the gun, but as far as I know, I haven't heard much in the way of uh, season five. Is there any, should I, do I need to cross both fingers? Is it odds looking good? <laughs> we're, you know, it's, uh, um, we're feeling very, very confident about continuing to tell our story. And we're just, you know, it's sort of above our pay grade in terms of all the, the, the things that are being worked out right now. But we're feeling positive, both network and studio, about creative direction of the show and, and the ratings and everything else. So we're, we're, we're very... Well, right? Wa yes. Cross your fingers while watching the show. <laughs> <coughs> and all right, put another question right there. Hi. Who was in the car driving up? <laughs> Do 
Yeah, that was actually the source of a slightly, slightly awkward conversation about 20 minutes ago. Yeah, just for the record, they just informed me that. <laughs> <laughs> Like, we got good news and we got bad news. Great episode, bad news is you're not at the end. <laughs> um, can you talk a little bit about the suit itself and the importance of dress on the show? <laughs> Well, we're still, part of what's holding up our pickup is we're still renegotiating with the suit. Yeah. <laughs> Four-season deal with the suit. The suit is really, really holding out on us. It's um, Hugo Boss. <laughs> and the, when I do the fight scenes, it's J.C. Penny. <laughs> I just want to say that for a show that is um, not supposed to be focused on relationships, you just do relationships so beautifully, all of them. Um, and since Shoot won the Zimbio poll just recently, I want to do a shout out to thank you for supporting Shoot. Thank you for Amy and Sarah, for all of you for supporting us as Shoot fans, and we are so happy you won. Oh, but um, <laughs> my question actually is. Um, you know, I think that Root has really interesting relationships that are really different from, you know, Harold, the major ones, Harold, Shaw, um, the machine. But my big question is, what is Root's relationship with the machine? Because at the end of 4.13, it seemed like you were breaking up with the machine, like leaving your God, and that was a huge thing. And then did, like, did you stop talking to the machine and then it for 4.15, the machine was like, come back and save Harold. <laughs> or did the machine stop talking to you? And then finally you're like, all right, I can't find sure I'm coming back because you're talking in 4.19, but you're not on good terms. So can someone give us a timeline, like a root <laughs> machine communication timeline? Okay. I think root's kind of similar to my like almost preteen son. Like some days <laughs> he doesn't want to talk to me and he storms out of the room. And <laughs> No, there's probably a real better answer. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I mean, I think that the way they wrote it, to me, it, I, I'm, I was curious at that end of, I guess it was 413 when we talked and I was kind of done with the machine, but it seemed like I there was a bigger, a bigger picture that had to be worked out. And I, I think that some of those holes kind of get filled in actually in the last couple of episodes where you see maybe what I've said isn't what I was feeling and, and kind of things like that. Yeah. <laughs> Next question. Let's go over here. Maybe. Uh, this question, I guess, is for um, Jonah and Greg. Uh, when Carter died, I noticed that the first time you showed the intro, she was out of it. But when Shaw left the show, she's still um, being shown in the intro. And I wanted to know, is that like the machine's way of saying all along that we we kind of knew she was alive, or is there a reason why she's still in it? Uh, have you seen the body? <laughs> That's a TV rule, yeah. If you've seen the body, you can, you know, they're dead. If not, um, hope springs eternal. But yeah, I think, um, you know, much as we love torturing the audience on these points, we've seen, you know, we've seen Sarah's character, she's out there somewhere. Um, and, and uh, it's really just a question of when we get to introduce that character. We have a we have a killer storyline for her uh, just as soon as she's she's back back to work. All right, let's go back maybe toward the back maybe yeah right there. Hi, um, do you keep Bear on the show? Like, is he going to stay for like the rest of the show? <laughs> <laughs> I I do like the dog. So uh, when we're all dead and gone. <laughs> Bear lives on. Yeah. <laughs> Bear's getting a spinoff, actually. He's getting his own show. <laughs> so right down here on the right? Sure. Wait, just wait for the microphone. Oh. Right here. Thank you. I am curious to know whether uh, this was written and then the cast was chosen or you knew who you had in mind you were writing specifically for them, or was somebody a relative that needed casting? <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's a 
yeah, and you... how does one to get to be a relative? How does one get to be a relative? Well, things happen very, very quickly when you're developing a broadcast TV show. But Greg and I have the ex extraordinary pleasure of getting to work with actors whose work we had long admired. Uh, and I had been a, a fan of all of these actors and all the different shows. Uh, you know, Kevin had been on Brotherhood, Showtime. Um, Amy, we knew and loved from Angel. Uh, Michael, I had, I had been a religious fan of Lost all the seasons that it was on. I think I actually went and saw The Thin Red Line five times in movie theaters when I was in school. So, you know, it's a, it's a, real, it's a real thrill to be able to work, work with these folks. As for the rest of the cast, it's mainly people who throw us kickbacks and, and you know, <coughs> unemployed family members and, and, and that sort of thing. If there's any more Royal Shakespeare, no one's will take it. <laughs> Let's go dead center right there. Hi, I have a question for Greg and Jonah, which is, um, will eventually the irrelevance will be recruited, uh, recruited? Because we know like Rude is building some kind of apps. Are you going to use the same way that Samaritans recruiting someone to transfer some specific person, like make them into team machine? Because we know like Samaritans like outnumber the, the, the team machine. Apparently, so I just want to know if like um, Team Machine Army will eventually be recruited. Yeah, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> Greg. Greg hasn't told me what happens in season five yet. I'm trying to pry it out of him. You, you know, it's it's been brought up a number of times when the particular person of interest of the week has has a skill set skill set, excuse me, that you, we might find advantageous in the fight against the Meriton. You, you never want it to be coincidental, but it, it is somewhat rich and rewarding when we can find people along the way. To recur on the show that might be, you know, instrumental in the fight against Samaritan. So, uh, definitely a, a path I think in season five that we're going to have to explore a little bit more in depth. So back on the right. Uh, um, you mentioned earlier watching the show helps, obviously. Um, does buying it on iTunes help? It seems like it should, but I don't know. And Amy Ecker, thank you for Fred and Illyria. Brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> um, we're grateful for viewers who are coming to the show from, you know, from anywhere. I mean, you know, this business is, is sort of in a bit of a transition where everyone's putting a little more emphasis on people who watch over the course of the first three weeks. Uh, the, the most valuable thing you can do to support the show is to watch the show within seven days of its airing on TV and watch the commercials. Please watch this. <laughs> Questions for Jonah. Um, will we ever get some root flashbacks before she first met the machine? Her life when she was That's assassin? a question for Greg. Because he was just talking about that the oh, other day. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. Will we get flashbacks to Root's life before she came in contact with Harold and the main cast? Oh, uh, that's too delicious to pass up. But yeah. Absolutely. Um, that'll be right after the bear flashbacks. <laughs> <laughs> My. Hi, this is for Michael. Um, would you like Carrie back in the show? Oh, sure. It's always fun to run into your spouse on the show. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's tricky, too, if I have scenes with her. I, I've said this before. It's, it's kind of hard to forget the wifeness of her <laughs> and just accept her as a fictional character. Because I, I, it's hard to be chilly, standoffish Mr. Finch when, when it's, it's someone that you slept with the night before. <laughs> <laughs> she's, the, she's the only one that will say to him, are you really going to do it that way? <laughs> Let's come right down here, and then we'll jump over this side there. I just want to say thank you for portraying veterans in a very great light. I love the way that you guys do it and the cast and crew are huge supporters so I appreciate that. I was wondering about side projects. It seems like you guys do all, everybody on stage kind of does multiple things in the hiatus. 
wonder if Joni can give us a heads up on Westworld and Foundation, what's going on with that. And Jamie, you've been making some killer movies the last couple of years. What can we expect from you? Hiatus right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Jim's going to have a nap. Just from that last episode alone. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a busy moment uh, for, for me right now. I mean, I'm sort of, sort of missing that the 10 years in which I would write a movie every couple of years and then surf for the, for the rest of the time. <laughs> I feel like I've signed up for something a little different here. Uh, incredibly excited about both Westworld and Foundation. Um, uh, uh, and uh, in fact, Robin Asimov, uh, Isaac Asimov's daughter, is here with us today. We're just, uh, we're just talking a little bit. Um, it's uh, uh, um, it, that's that's you know two dream projects for me that are now coming together, um, in in this kind of environment in which television has just become so ambitious in in the last few years. It feels like you can you can you can tell stories at the the the, the highest possible scope and scale. I mean, we're here with First of Interest in New York. We shoot outside, you know, virtually every day, which is something that's kind of unheard of a few years ago in television. The West World. Uh, very, very, very excited about it. It's, you know, it's got a, a great scope and ambition, and HBO is a fantastic partner. Um, and Foundation's my favorite books of all time, so incredibly lucky to be, to be working on this project. Okay. We'll run over here. Yeah. Hi. Um, as much of a thank you as anything, um, I think Root is one of the best written TV characters ever um, and portrayed um, <laughs> incredibly well, too. Just the arc that she's made, and I've been a fan of Amy's going back to when they uh, found a Winifred Burkle in a cave in Pylea. <laughs> um, but um, so I guess my question, Amy, you, uh, you seem so nice, sweet, no nor normal, um, but you're so good at playing crazy. How what do you do to get into <laughs> Okay, wh what do you do to get into, uh, into the zone? Oh, maybe it is too easy. I don't know. <laughs> um, well, I mean, the writing is so great on the show, and and it's it's just the thing. Every episode, I I am always excited to see what I'm gonna get to do. Um, I I guess I'm probably if you ask my husband, maybe he would say I'm more towards the crazy side. <laughs> Um, but I don't kill this many people nearly <laughs> as <well. laughs> Go right back there, the man in the green shirt. I just wanted to know the name of the Nat King Cole song that you played at the end. That was actually Jim's suggestion. Um, Gre Greg and I are very close with the mysterious uh, music uh, uh, music supervisor for our show, uh, who, who's somewhat anonymous. Uh, we help them pick all of the songs for the show. And Jim had suggested suggested this particular Nat King Cole song a couple of years ago uh, for an episode spiritually like this one, um, and it's called, I believe, Happy New Year. That's right. It's a wonderful song. <laughs> Just a little bit in front of that previous question here in the denim jacket. Um, I just had a question about like Root's identity. She has all these identities, and I was wondering if you have like a favorite, and like where do you guys even come up with some of them? <laughs> <laughs> and also, uh, a lot of people told me to say hello to all of you, so. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I, for me, I, probably my, I, I don't know, it's a toss-up, I guess, between Bear Suit and French Nanny, I think. <laughs> <laughs> they've, they've all been fun. The, the wedding dress was pretty fun, too. I, <laughs> I, any chance to rip up a wedding dress with running shoes? <laughs> Anybody down here, maybe? Hi, I'm, I'm a longtime uh, fan of the show. I've been selling it to my friends, getting convincing them to watch uh, since season one, telling them, hey, watch this show. It's got Jesus kicking butt. Uh, <laughs> so that, that's, my, that's been my selling point, and uh, Jim Caviezel has definitely rocked the show since. Uh, but the show's definitely uh, come a long way. Uh, Jonah Nolan does some fantastic writing with all of these great relationships, 
and bringing in these great actors and actresses with uh, Amy Acker coming on, we were all very excited. So my question to the cast is, what are, what are your favorite relationships, both uh, romantic and not romantic? Uh, for example, uh, fin Finch and uh, Reese as a, as a friendship is a great dynamic. So what are, what are your favorite relationships in the show? Um, <laughs> I, I do love the relationship between Root, Root and Fusco. It's, it's kind of um, a scary one. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, of course, Fusco and Reese, some days, <laughs> when he's nice to him. <laughs> I, I tend to really enjoy adversarial s situations, so I, I like it when I'm in a a confined space with someone who wants me dead. <laughs> <laughs> because it, you know, it lends gravity to the dialogue. <laughs> I think we have time for a couple more. Maybe right there. Hi. Um, I can honestly say that I could, that, like if someone said to me, who's your favorite character? I couldn't even pick one. But um, because I think it, you're all awesome. Um, but I was wondering, for the writers or the producers, do you think um, is Zoe or Leon coming back? Because I like them too. <laughs> uh, we would love to have Leon back. He's phenomenal. Um, uh, Zoe, uh, the chemistry is kind of undeniable, isn't it? It's really uh, it's something we can't seem to get away from. Um, Paige Turco's such such a fantastic actress. We always feel like if there's somebody that pops in our world or there's chemistry. Let's find a way to get him back if we can. So, absolutely. Is there a question over here? Yeah. Uh, Jim, I had a, a question for you, and if you need a few seconds to think through your answer, I'll understand. <laughs> but on a week-to-week -week basis, would you say you enjoy beating up people on the show more than you enjoy beating up Schwarzenegger and Stallone and escape plan but getting blown up? <laughs> I love them both the same. <laughs> and then we'll, just, we'll do a final question here. One of the fun things that we've been able to see is everyone except Fusco riding on a motorcycle, including Finch. That was amazing. So do, are we ever going to be able to see maybe Reese and Fusco being motorcycle cops together? <laughs> hey, you need a The funny part, I'm the only one that rides a motorcycle in real life. <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> part of the reason why there are so many motorcycles in the show is that my wife, uh, for ba when we got married, said I wasn't allowed to ride a motorcycle anymore. Yeah. So I figured out if we put one on the show, I could come to set on the days the motorcycle was there, yeah. and I, at lunch, I could take it and ride around <laughs> Manhattan. <so. laughs> True story. So we're going to have to come up with more excuses for motorcycles on the show. All right. Well, I think on behalf of the panel, CBS, everyone here, thank you guys for coming. Give it up for the cast. <laughs>